All right, uh, so my name is Matthew Fredrickson. Um, for those who are not familiar with me, I'm the uh, project lead for the Asterisk Project. Um, I just want to start off first and uh, ask how many of you are familiar with Asterisk? Okay, this is great. I wasn't sure. It's been around for a long time, but you know, the world has changed quite a bit. Um, and I just want to make sure that I understood the audience I was speaking with. So um, uh, let's get started. Um, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with the background of the Asterisk Project, um, it was kind of the baby of Mark Spencer, who started the company Digium uh, about 15 years ago, or 20, around 15, 20 years ago. And uh, so it's been a critical part of Digium. Um, there's been uh, a lot of developers within Digium, as well as outside of Digium, that have contributed to it. But um, Digium has kind of been a big part of, of Asterisk's life for a very long time. And just this last year, for those who aren't familiar, uh, Digium was acquired by a company called Sangoma. And you may notice that Sangoma, um, the, the new Sangoma logo, for those who are familiar with the old logo, has acquired a little bit of asterisk flair to it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the world's not on fire or anything like that. For those that are concerned, uh, the asterisk is still a very important part of uh, Sangoma. Uh, it was an important part of Digium, and now is also a very important part of Sangoma as well. They have a lot of products and projects internally that utilize Asterisk, and so it's, uh, it's still safe in terms of, of its uh, company stewardship. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the things that happen. That's what I try to do is, for those of you that are not able to attend the yearly Asterisk conference in Astrocon, I try to come here um, to this conference to be able to update everybody on what's happened in the world of Asterisk. Um, just by a raise of hands, uh, how many of you utilize Asterisk somewhere in, in your network or deploy it or, or something like that? Oh, this is wonderful. All right, great. How many of you develop applications based on Asterisk? So maybe not like utilizing pre-built functionality in Asterisk, but maybe like utilizing APIs and things like that in Asterisk to build higher level applications. Yeah, more hands raised. This is great. Actually, this is really good. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about some things that are probably going to be interesting to many of you. Um, so uh, just kind of in review, Asterisk 15.x received a number of bug fix releases this last year. This is actually pulled from a lot of my slides from Astrocon, which was in September. So some of the numbers may line up more with September's time frame. Uh, but the current version of 15 is 15.7.1. Uh, current version of 14 is 14.7.7. And actually, it is dead. It is end of life uh, because it was, a, it was a standard release, and it went end of life uh, right around the time of release 16 back in September. Um, and Asterisk 13 is still, it is an LTS and it is still current. There are still, there are still um, new releases that are made of that branch and will for the next few years. Um, over the course of the past year since Astrocon, um, there were 3,300 merge code reviews across all the branches that we support. And for those of you that are not familiar with the development model of Asterisk, is we support multiple release branches at the same time. We allow, um, we have a very good test infrastructure in Asterisk and allows us to be able to be a little bit more bold in terms of how we manage those branches. And, and we even allow new features and functionality that are non-breaking to enter those branches, um, you know, assuming you don't you know, break anything and also that you add tests and things like that for that functionality as well. So we have kind of a, a non-traditional uh, release model or, or inclusion model for our branches, but it allows us to be a lot more flexible in terms of delivering code to people a lot quicker. Um, so 3,300 code reviews is a lot. That means there's a, a lot of work that's going into the project at a developmental level. It means it is very much a very active project in development. It takes a lot of time to do those code reviews and a lot of maintenance. So those of you that are developers, I would, uh, I would urge you to try to participate in that process as well. It's a good way to learn the code base if you're not familiar with it, and it helps to keep in, uh, improving the quality of the submissions and things like that. Um, and so I, I mentioned this already, but Astra 16 was released a few months ago for those that uh, had not heard. It included over 1,000 different commits, so that's almost three per day. Um, there were, of those commits, there were 72 distinct or different contributors, and actually now we're up to 16.1.1. So there's been a few release, there's been at least one release, major release since then. Um, so for those of you who utilize uh, asterisk in production environments, sometimes there are three magical letters that matter that might matter a little bit more to you, and those are the, the letters LTS. Uh, in asterisk world, 
Um, see, those, those letters mean different things to different projects. But in Astros World, that means that, you, that that branch receives four years of bug fixes and one additional year of security fixes. And some of the LTS branches in Astros World are the 11.x major version, the 13.x major version, and, uh, and, and anyway. So standard releases are shorter. Um, there's a year of bug fixes and uh, an additional year of security only fixes. And some e examples of standard releases in asterisk versions are 12.x, 14.x, and actually 15.x. And you're probably... 15. Yep, 15 is a standard. OK, so good. I'm glad you brought that up. So I want to talk about this because we, so 15, um, we uh, made a decision with 15. We made some major changes to the core of 15, including uh, multi-stream video support, multi, uh, multimedia stream support for calls and things like that, that we wanted to give some more time to bake before we included it in a long-term supported release. And so we broke convention. So typically, the odd-numbered releases are LTSs in Astros World. Historically, that's what they've been. Uh, but we broke convention, and 15 was a standard release instead of an LTS. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of the background there. Uh, Astros 16 was things, things have gone well with the multi-stream changes. They've been surprisingly stable. Um, they've worked very well in terms of our targets and goals with them. And uh, from an architectural perspective, we felt that they were ready to go in. And from a stability perspective, we felt they were ready to be baked into a long-term release. And so 16 actually got, met, got, got graduated into, a, a six in a, into an LTS. And so it should be around until at least 2022 and in terms of bug fixes and should receive an additional year of security fixes uh, and die hopefully a quiet death in 2023. Um, so Astro 16, what happened in Astro 16? So I, actually, tons of things happened in Astro 16. A thousand commits. My job as project lead is to go through those commits and curate things and try to like fit it into a 20-minute time period and talk to you about it. So I'm, I'm going to talk about flashy things, but there's a, you know the new flashiness, right? But there's actually a lot more than what, I, than what I'm talking about that, that actually happened and occurred. Um, so mostly I'm going to focus on some of the big pushes that we've, in terms of big project level pushes that we've, we've pushed for the last few years. And that's a lot in the, on the video side of things and making Astros a better media platform, multimedia platform. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about ChampPJ SIP as well. So uh, in Astros 15, we did a lot, as I mentioned, we did a lot of work to improve the video. We, we made the Astros code base suitable to be used in an SFU, multi-stream SFU type environment. We extended it. And um, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of work. Uh, but it seemed like it went well. Um, in an effort to get that code out quicker and to make things happen, we kind of took a sledgehammer approach in terms of video quality and video packet loss. And we, what we essentially did was we told the other end if we, we, so for those that aren't familiar, with video, it's very sensitive to packet loss. If you have RTP packet loss, um, you start seeing funny things happen. The people freeze. Or you know, if you have video corruption, you have like pieces of body parts flying across because the video decoder context. I, I'm sure many of you have seen that before in different um, video uh, applications and things like that. But it's an unpleasant experience. And so what Astros 15 did to remedy packet loss uh, situations was it requested a full video frame from the remote end again in kind of a sledgehammer approach, which, which is suitable. But um, it takes a lot of bandwidth and sometimes can have latency implications as well. Um, and so there are some better technologies to, to handle that, uh, more finer grain technologies to handle that in browsers nowadays. Um, and one of those is called uh, a NAC, is the NAC message, RT RTCP NAC message. And so we implemented support for NAC, which is essentially a request for a retransmission of a video packet. And so um, that went in, and, and it made a big difference in terms of like how much bandwidth it takes to, uh, to fix packet loss and things like, things like that. Um, there's another technology we added support for, which is widely deployed across, across browsers, called RemB. And it's the receivers. So in, in video, it is the, re the receivers. I guess it could apply to audio as well. But primarily, uh, it was uh, built out to be used in, in video and is used in video. But is the receiver's perception of the, the local bandwidth that it has, right? So, um, for example, if you're on a, uh, a low bandwidth connection and, and somebody's transmitting video and they're in a high bandwidth connection, they're sending a meg and a half of video to you. 
and you are receive you can only receive 64k of video some teeny tiny stream there is no way that packet retransmission is going to fix that problem because you're in a situation where there's no way to send a meg and a half stream down a 64 kilobit pipe right so in this case this allows the receiver to send the remote the remote end that it's only receiving approximately 64 kilobits and allows the transmitter to change the video encoding rate to be something a lot smaller, right, to fit in that pipe. So it's a good technology, especially when you're, you've got heterogeneous networks with different uh, last mile speeds and things like that. Um, the, we added support for what we like to, what we called enhanced messaging. So um, as part of the work that we did to build SFU support and asterisk, we focused a lot on the multimedia part, or the, the media part of it, like the video and the audio and making it all work together. Um, and we uh, added some REST. If, for those of you familiar with Asterisk REST interface for programming, programmatically control it, we add some, some hooks for the multimedia video stuff and the REST API and things like that. Um, and then we built our fun engineering prototype. It's not very pretty by the world standards, but as engineers that don't do front end programming, it's, it's what we got, right? Um, patches welcome. Um, so we realized that. We, we built out that experience where all those video people were there, but we realized that we didn't add APIs to be able to correlate those video streams as on the client to like caller ID information or specific participant uh, participant related metadata or information. And so we kind of, um, after we realized that, we kind of hit our head and said, oh man, <laughs> how did we miss that? Um, and so we added support to be able to, uh, within, the conferencing application with Asterisk to be able to send participant level information to be able to correlate, okay, this media stream matches up to this participant information, this caller ID information, maybe this uh, identification value so you can do lookups and things like that in database and, and build rich clients and things like that. Um, and so uh, that was one part of it. Another part was being able to do participant to participant messaging within the context of that conference bridge as well. So if you're building, uh, trying to build rich applications on top of the asterisk SFU environment, one thing that you probably want to do is have participants be able to talk to each other uh, in, via text or be able to send information back and forth to each other. So we added support to be able to bridge uh, SIP messages back and forth between each other, between the participants. Um, and they can, be, they can be plain text or you can do like uh, base 64, and they can do dip, uh, any kind of MIME type that you can think of. And so you can send binary data, binary encoded data, and things like that as well. Like if you want to send photographs or uh, images and whatever else you can, you can uh, imagine might fit in your, in your application. Um, the other thing I want to talk about um, is PJSIP and performance improvements. So for those of you that deploy Asterisk, how many of you are familiar with Chan PJSIP? Okay, so not so many hands as before. How many of you are familiar with Chen SIP? Maybe a few more hands. So um, the history there, for those who are not familiar, is Chen SIP is the legacy SIP channel driver. Um, we took a step back a few years ago, and we realized that Chen SIP was getting to the point where, from a code base perspective, it was very difficult to uh, make bug fixes and make improvements and things like that. Um, we ran in a situation where we would fix one bug, and we would inadvertently create three more. Uh, that kind of situation. And as developers, that, that can be very challenging to start from that situation and try to move to a better situation um, through, through uh, iteration. So what we did is we took a step back and decided to start, take all the things that we learned about SIP in the about you know, 10 to 15 years that we'd, we'd um, developed on ChanSIP, and we built a new ch SIP channel driver using all those lessons that we learned uh, called ChanPJSIP. And so Chan PJSIP is the successor to Chan SIP. If you are building applications with asterisks that utilize SIP, Chan PJSIP is the channel driver you should be using. Um, and we want to make sure that there's no good reason that anybody would want to continue to use Chan SIP. Um, so we found at an Astrocon, it was not this last one, but the one prior, somebody presented a paper uh, or a presentation about Chan SIP, and some uh, there were uh, in most cases, Chan PJSIP performed better, but there were a couple of cases where uh, Chan SIP uh, had a, a slight uh, advantage over Chan PJSIP, and so we wanted to address those because we have we want n we want everybody to use Chan PJSIP, and like I said, have no reason to go back to Chan SIP. 
Um, and so uh, what we did is we, we took that case. It was a, it was a case of uh, inbound SIP registration performance, handling, handling inbound SIP registrations and how many registrations that it could handle per second. And if you look at these two graphs, um, this is the before and this is the after. And the, the bar in blue, the, the uh, y-axis is the percentage of CPU utilized. So lower is better. The, the x-axis is the number of registrations sent per second. So registration mes messages per second. If you can have a lower bar, that means you're better. Um, in previously, so the graph on the left, you'll see that Chan SIP, the blue bar, had about, uh, I mean, it looks like about five percentage points difference in terms of, it was about 5% better in terms of registrations per second, all the way up to the 300 registrations per second case. Um, if you'll notice on the right, after we looked at that and tried to fix some things there, we, we managed to fix that problem. And you'll notice now that Chan PJ SIPs per performs uh, about, you know, 2% better in some of those two, one, two, three percent better in, uh, in that particular use case. Now, I, I want to talk about something in these graphs that are, uh, you know, there's a glaring missing bar on the 350 registrations per second. Um, we found out, so CHAMP PJSIP is built in a way to handle multi-cord processors very well, to scale across, do protocol processing across multi-cord processors very well. Um, we found that CHANSIP was unable to handle past 300 registrations per second without basically uh, failing. CHAMP PJSIP was though, so 350. So we decided to run some more tests and we found out this is, we brought it up to 2,000 registrations per second, and we found out with this simple system that we're doing benchmarking on that, uh, again, Chan SIP could not get past 300 registrations per second, but Chan PJ SIP was able to handle 2,000 registrations per second on this particular system, and it probably could have kept going. There's still, still some more headroom. So, there are no good reasons to use Chan SIP, and if you can find one, I would love to hear about it because we, we want to keep making sure that there's no good reason to go back to it. Um, I, ge I guess going further, we actually found some more things that we could do to improve performance in Chan PJ SIP. And if you'll notice that the delta, what before was only a 1 or 2% two per two difference between Chan SIP and Chan PJ SIP, um, in 16.1, which is the most recent release of Asterisk, we, we continued to widen that gap. And so now it's like 3 or 4% difference. So we're, keep on, we're continuing to whittle away on that. So, uh, anyway, I thought that might be interesting to see. Um, so I want to talk a little bit just for a moment about um, what's happening next. So what's happening after 16.0? Well, um, we've done some work to uh, do more performance improvements. You know, after you've done a few cycles of major feature additions and things like that, like we have for the last few major releases of Asterisk, it's I think inadvertently you always, there are some places that maybe you, you made performance worse in different parts of the system, different use cases and things like that. So uh, Astro 17 is uh, one of our big things that we're going to work on is going back and benchmarking things, trying to figure out where, if there are situations where we made things worse in terms of performance and try to continue to improve that, try to push, push that performance bar. Um, we also added some support for those of you that utilize Astro's REST interface to be able to filter events so that your REST applications don't have to receive every single event that comes uh, from Asterisk and be able to have to process each one of those and reduce the load on your REST application. And then we also have added so far um, some support for doing uh, REST applications without having dial plan as well. And that's actually in a code review um, that's, that's, uh, that should be going in probably soon. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. My time is running short. I had to make this really fast. So this is uh, a lot quicker than I, I usually spend on this. But just as a reminder, like I said, Asterisk 14 went end of life. Um, in September. So if you're on Asterisk 14 or utilize ver uh, features of Asterisk 14, uh, it's a good idea to get off of it and at least move to 15. But even 15 now is in security fix only mode. So 16 might be a good place to, to park. Um, and so uh, also I would uh, counsel you for those of you that run Asterisk in production or utilize it, is keep it, uh, you know, there is a desire a lot of times to stick to LTSs. But it would be a good idea to make sure you keep on top of what's happening in the normal releases as well. Um, we generally try to make new releases of Asterisk as boring as possible for users. And by boring, I mean 
we try not to break things or surprise you about things, right? If there's new functionality, we try not to make it so that it regresses the way you, you know, it, it impacts the way you use it in an existing way and it is, ex it is an extended type experience. Um, but sometimes we miss things. And so it's always better to catch those things early and report them early while we're still working on them because we're better able to go back and address those things as well. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys very much for your time and for letting me come share with you a little bit about share with you a little bit about the project.